What do Kirk Hammett, Bruce Campbell, H.R. Giger, and Tom Cruise have in common? I mean, other than being decidedly more famous than I am. They've all influenced the creators of the seminal 1990s first-person shooter masterpiece, Doom. Kirk Hammett is the lead guitarist for Metallica, a band which would influence the iconic guitar-inspired full-throttle music of Doom. Bruce Campbell starred in the classic Evil Dead films, which prominently featured a double-barreled shotgun complemented by a groovy chainsaw. Sound familiar? H.R. Giger's illustration compendium, The Necronomicon, would inspire the unsettling biomechanical imagery present in the game. And, of course, Tom Cruise once said Doom in a movie. What does all that have to do with this video? Nothing, really. They're just fun Doom facts. No, what we're really here for is the likely unwinnable assignment of determining the very best classic Doom levels. That's right, to honor the upcoming Doom Eternal, we're going to break down the 10 best levels in classic Doom gaming. Before we get going though, we're gonna need to set up some ground rules. After all, what even is a classic Doom level? For logistical and organizational purposes, we're only going to take levels from officially released products, using or emulating the original Doom engine. No major changes to movement or looking, no custom items, no fan-made enemies, none of that. So, sorry Midway Games, but because Doom 64 is on a different engine with fundamental differences to level architecture and design, not to mention entirely different sprites, sounds, and enemy designs, it's being rendered invalid here even though it is technically an official Doom title. And because John Romero's admittedly brilliant sigil is technically an unofficial entry for the original Doom, it is also ineligible for this list. Also no Scythe, Scythe 2, or Alien Vendetta. With those qualifiers in mind, there are around 170 levels, depending on which version or port you look at, in the official Doom catalog made using the original Doom engine and system of mechanics. Those come from Doom, Doom 2, and Final Doom, and the various ports and re-releases that came along with each one. Now with all that being said, it would be criminal to neglect some levels, even if they don't quite make it to the top 10 list. So before we get to the main list, let's touch on some runners-up, in no particular order. So let's lock and load and rip and tear because these are the 10 best classic Doom levels of all time. Number 10, Stronghold. One half of Final Doom, TNT Evolution, was originally designed as a fan project to be released for free. But when John Romero, who was still working with id Software at the time, caught wind of the project, he insisted that it be released as an official product alongside the Plutonia experiment in 1996. As such, having Romero's endorsement in a commercial capacity is a clear sign that there is some seriously great level design in Final Doom. Stronghold likens back to the glory days of the original Doom's Knee Deep in the Dead, with a prominently militaristic aesthetic. It's flooded with zombie soldiers, barracks-like corridors, and considerably less demonic influence. It keeps the combat simple and satisfying like Doom's first episode, allowing for you to mow through dozens of soldiers and imps with a chain gun and shotgun, a feeling you seldom get beyond Doom 93. 
But with the added challenge of the heavy weapon dudes and the fantastic super shotgun to accompany you, this level reminds Doom players where they came from while adding the newer elements of Doom 2. In addition to being a truly classic Doom level with modern elements, it is notorious in its layout and execution, often cited as the primary reason for why Evolution is the most difficult Doom game to complete a single Nightmare speedrun for. To date, the only person to publicly complete Evolution on Nightmare in one sitting is Zero Master, a Doom veteran unlike any other. And I imagine if you utter the word Stronghold to him in the context of Doom, he would likely cringe. Number 9. Hunted. The Plutonia Experiment, Map 11. The Plutonia Experiment is the other half of the aforementioned Final Doom, having been designed exclusively by Dario and Milo Casali, each having created 16 levels for Plutonia. Oddly, however, it is not readily apparent who did which level specifically, so only those two brothers can tell you who designed each individual level. Either of them could have gifted us with the nightmare fuel that is Hunted. On the surface, it is a gimmick level. You spawn in what appears to be a mortuary, with coffins filling one half of the room. As you step forward, a wall on the opposite end of the room reveals a number of arch vials, the most menacing and infamous monsters in the game, apart from the boss-like Cyberdemon and Spider Mastermind. They don't seem to notice you at first, but if you press the switch ahead of you to proceed through the level, they all teleport away, announcing their knowledge of your presence. You step outside, only to find yourself in a labyrinth peppered with those horrifying arch vials throughout, making every turn around every corner a truly tense experience. So yes, it is a pretty easy concept, just design a maze, sprinkle it with a number of the most nerve-wracking enemies in the game. The actual number depends on the difficulty you're playing, but that doesn't really matter because Ultraviolence is the only true difficulty. And you're off to the races! But the uncertainty of where any given archvile is at, at any given time, and the way you defend against them by ducking behind corners makes it all work perfectly. The only way to make it any more tense is to flavor it with a lullaby-like melody that devolves into a twisted score of madness and fear. Oh, oh, oh wait. Okay, okay, this, this is, this is not okay. This is not okay. Make it stop. I don't. Number eight, the Earth Base. Doom 2, No Rest for the Living. Map 1. In 2010, Doom 2 was re-released on the Xbox Live Arcade, and bundled with it was a bonus episode called No Rest for the Living. This version would also become commercially available for PS3 and PC owners via the Doom 3 BFG edition released in 2012. These bonus levels were designed like a classic episode of Doom, with 8 primary levels and 1 bonus secret level. With the hindsight of what makes a truly great Doom level work, thanks to over a decade of official releases and fan projects widely circulated, the team at Nerve Software was able to design some truly exceptional levels. The pilot level, the Earth Base, has example upon example of how to masterfully craft cunning environments, intuitive progression, and rewarding exploration. What makes this level work so damn well is that it initially plays out like a simple first level affair, emphasizing zombie soldiers, imps, and pinkies early on, but ramping it up the deeper you get. If the player takes the time to track down all of the secret areas, they will be rewarded with better items early on, but also tested by monsters you wouldn't expect in a first level, such as Hell Knights, Mancubi, and Revenants. There are also just great little aesthetic design choices found throughout the level, like this door that appears locked in place, partially open, revealing a secret area behind it, and this courtyard's rounded geography that complements the straight walls of the militaristic compound. Switches are also placed in a way that more easily allows the player to see what effects happen upon toggling them, reducing the amount of unintuitive backtracking that bogs down some other levels. There's really nothing else to say about this level, it's just admirably solid from start to finish, and more levels could benefit from its overall range. Kudos to Nerf Software for truly knowing how to make a brilliant introductory Doom level. Number 7, Containment Area. Doom E2 M2. The second episode of Doom 93, The Shores of Hell, revolves around the player finding themselves on the Mars moon Deimos. However, Hell's influence begins to overtake the UAC facility established on it, resulting in militaristic bases melding with demonic infestation. The second level of this episode, Containment Area, sees the player starting off in a typical storage facility connected to a curiously castle-like Grand Hall. For that reason, the aesthetic range of this level is absolutely iconic. When it comes to the raw gameplay of Doom, the player's high movement speed demands large environmental layouts, and stacks of storage containers scattered throughout are interesting to navigate mechanically while giving realistic size and geometric variety. 
As such, the introductory storage area would go on to serve as influence for design choices prevalent in many Doom levels thereafter. Can anyone say foreshadowing? But it isn't just the storage area, which, according to an interview with Tom Hall, was influenced by 1981's Raiders of the Lost Ark. As mentioned earlier, the Grand Stone Hall filled with imps is a curious addition to the layout. The level also introduces crushing ceilings for the first time. As the player, you're forced to complete a small gauntlet of them while charging into the oncoming fire of more imps. The fun part is letting them come to you so you can watch them fall victim to the crushing blocks themselves. An absolute staple of classic Doom containment area is undoubtedly one for the books. Number 6, Storage Facility. TNT Evolution, Map 11. Hey, speaking of large storage areas because they work so darn well for Doom's engine, Evolution's 11th level storage facility is pretty much the cream of the crop. And what makes this level so much fun to navigate is that the player starts outside of the actual facility, forcing them to fight their way inside to advance. What's truly admirable is that the architectural layout and building's exterior are proportionally and stylistically pretty friggin' realistic. You see, because Doom requires relatively large maps to reward exploration and to allow for fast, fluid combat, it can be difficult to accurately emulate realistic environments for levels based around easily identified locations and components. As technology advanced, it got much easier, as we began to see with Brutal Doom's Earth-based levels. But in the early days, it was more irritating and less important to depict realistic environments. It was all about the mechanics. So, for storage facility to have logically placed fences, garages, a checkpoint booth, and even an obviously designed prison-style watchtower complete with heavy weapon dude is actually quite brilliant. There are even small pockets of the obligatory demonic influence, like this conspicuously placed pentagram on the asphalt, which presents the player with a rocket launcher, but spawns in an arch vial if interacted with. The player's progression through the level is intuitive and rewarding. And with the facility itself having varying heights of crate stacks that can be climbed, it allows the player to scale what seems like mountains of boxes and a ceiling-high warehouse, adding a fun flavor of verticality to the gameplay. For me, this level is a staple of evolution. I always anticipate it with glee, and I always love to punch through it. Number 5, Wormhole. TNT, Evolution, Map 4. Okay, look. Evolution is just seriously great Doom. Yeah, there are some less interesting levels in the second half of the game, and the lack of an episodic structure can make it kind of a drag to get to the good levels. But Doom 2, an absolute classic in the eyes of Doom fans, has admittedly kind of the same structural problems. Okay. That's a fair point. Side note, if Doom Eternal has an episodic presentation of levels, I will seriously be the absolute giddiest. Anyway, Wormhole is undeniably the best level to come out of Evolution. It just is. It's got a strong start, dropping the player into what seems to be the front lobby of corporate headquarters with waiting benches and prominent stairs on either side of the large room, filled with shotgun guys, heavy weapon dudes, imps, and specters. As you advance, you reach the dark, dingy back halls where it becomes clear that there is something more sinister afoot here. You may find the secret hallways, indicated by the candles on the floor as you leave the main lobby, but no, that's not it. If you happen to stumble upon a secret lift that lowers you into a cave-like basement, you'll be greeted by these strange blue and red bars. You proceed through, only to seemingly teleport to a new location. But wait, this is the same location. Or is it? Those aren't the same imps you just killed. And where did this chainsaw come from? That specter definitely wasn't there before. You take the lift back to the dingy halls, only to be greeted by more specters and even revenants. At this point, it becomes clear. You've stumbled into another dimension. The same corporate facility, but with more sinister undertones about it. And as you proceed backwards into the main lobby, gone are the shotgun guys and heavy weapon dudes. There is only pain and suffering here in the form of specters, mancubi, and even an arachnotron. Don't worry, you'll get back to your home dimension. Somehow. This level would go on to serve as one of the earliest examples of the Dark World trope, introduced by The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past in 1992. Sure, Zelda did it first, and would even popularize it further with Ocarina of Time. But Evolution's Wormhole is the first example of the idea being implemented in a first-person shooter. I mean, I'm pretty sure, you know, like, citation needed, you know, feel free to correct me in the comments. Whatever. This entire level is just a delight to run through, from start to finish, and it's made all the better by being speedrunner friendly. So you can simply run up the right stairwell, proceed through the door, then back around again to find the exit open for you. So even if all you want to do is blitz through the game like the Doom Slayer high on a haste power-up, this level won't bog you down. 
there's something for everyone to love about Wormhole. Number 4. Dead Simple. Doom 2, Map 7. Doom 2 famously introduced several new monsters that would go on to be classics, and while some of them were found simply moseying about various levels like the Revenant in the Crusher's opening area, or the Heavy Weapon Dude among a slew of imps and zombies in the Gantlet, Dead Simple took a more boisterous approach with the Mancubus. The player starts off the seventh level in a decidedly cramped space, gifted with a super shotgun, dozens of shells, and a backpack to keep it all in. Toggling the switch directly in front of you makes the wall slowly lower to the ground, revealing an open courtyard with four prominent pedestals arranged evenly around the center. Oh, and several abominable alien-like creatures with giant flame cannons for arms ready to toast your puny human body. The iconic Mancubus spits out a barrage of fireballs, two at a time, in bursts of three volleys. Sure, it sounds manageable, but it's far worse when there are a half dozen of them scattered all around you all at once. After scraping by, the courtyard opens up even more, announcing the arrival of the plasma-wielding cyber spiders, the brainy arachnotrons. Only upon killing every monster does the central podium become accessible, allowing you to escape to the next level. This entire level is pure combat and skill. No puzzles, no levity to let you catch your breath, filled exclusively with monsters not previously introduced, forcing the player to memorize new enemy patterns and develop new strategies on the fly. Dead Simple is unforgettable. Its influence is undeniable, with Doom 64, Brutal Doom, and even Doom 2016 giving their own spins on the design. And, best of all, it's perfect for Deathmatch. The number of hours that I spent personally playing Deathmatch with my brother and my dad and all of the years leading up to this, too many to count. Frantically picking up megaspheres and rocket launchers and plasma rifles and super shotguns and... Ah, just too many great memories. A dynamite level for anyone who loves the combat of Doom in any capacity. Number 3, Hellkeep slash Warrens. Doom E3-M1 slash E3-M9. Okay, am I cheating here? Maybe a little. But to give credit to Doom's first full-blown Hell level, Hell Keep, without also acknowledging the clever warrants to accompany it, would be a terrible injustice. Inferno, the final episode of the original Doom, not counting Thy Flesh Consumed, the bonus episode released in the form of the Ultimate Doom in 1995, begins with the unforgettable Hell Keep. Gone are the industrial military bases of the UAC, the game plunges into the depths of a fully realized hell. And it isn't just the fire and brimstone as depicted in Christian mythology. Hellkeep sees you begin in an almost womb-like enclosure. You stand atop a pile of what seems to be entrails with disturbing columns of spines and ribs forming the walls around you. Upon toggling the nightmarishly placed eyeball staring directly at you, the pile of guts rises from underneath, bringing you to the surface of hell. You find yourself immediately surrounded by imps. If you try to advance, in the hopes of finding better firepower in the door ahead, you only find yourself in a worse situation with caco demons waiting to greet you. After moving forward, you can find a shotgun, so long as you're quick on your feet and prepared to take a leap of faith, avoiding a massive pit of burning blood. With better firepower, you stand a more reasonable chance of advancing beyond the stone hallways filled with pinky demons, but you better make sure you still have enough ammo and grit to take on the gang of imps just before the exit. Apart from the side path leading to the shotgun, this level is actually quite linear, but damn does it leave a good impression. It serves as a brilliant introduction to the demon's home dimension of hell with its gory landscape and bloody skyscape. It's made even more unnervingly abstract by these strange trees growing from the fleshy ground. Okay, so what's the deal with Warrens, though? Inferno's secret level, it initially plays out exactly the same way as Hellkeep. The same monsters, triggers, items, everything. The only clue that the game hasn't actually glitched out and made you repeat the same level again is the different music selection. So what happens when you reach the exit? The stone walls around you lower to reveal a much more open area with, ooh, that's a lot of rockets and a supercharge. Boy, this is your lucky- OH GOD, THAT'S A CYBER DEMON! You can either fight him head on or retreat, only to be stuck in a small room with more caca demons. Surprise! To complete Warrens, you must backtrack to the beginning of the level, with secret areas having been opened to reveal various nasty surprises for you along the way, in the form of specters, lost souls, and even a baron of hell. 
And you better save your game before the last room, too, if you weren't lucky enough to pick up an invulnerability sphere. You're in for a real piece of work there. Hellkeep epitomizes the hell aesthetic of Doom. It's an unforgettable first step into unholy, action-packed shooting mayhem, and Warren's is the cleverly sinister reflection of it. Number 2, The Spirit World. Doom 2, Map 28. John Romero has reportedly stated that Doom 2's 28th map, The Spirit World, is one of his favorite Doom levels, so if the penultimate godfather of Doom himself has high praises for it, it must be pretty damn good. The Spirit World's most memorable locales include a cave-like area with stalagmites forming around you, and bloody fissures laced into the ground and walls. To advance, you must find the bloody opening just big enough to fit through, only to find yourself in a massive, cavernous area made seemingly of pure, unholy energy. Pain elementals are enclosed in a cage, arachnatrons swarm a ravine, and there isn't just one, but two spider masterminds ready to tear you to shreds. Luckily, you can reach a BFG, plenty of energy cell packs, and even a couple of invulnerability spheres if you manage to avoid the crossfire. Beyond this sick and twisted cavern, however, is what appears to be a throne room. Empty at first, you toggle a skull switch to reveal a king-like arch vial backed up by hell knights who demand your head. Upon clearing out the demonic hierarchy, you reach the back halls, made from perpetually moving spines and rib cages. Hiding behind false walls are an arachnatron and a squadron of zombie soldiers. And finally, after revealing a secret passage filled with the gooey entrails that made up the landscape of the iconic Hell Keep, complete with more arch vials, you race back to the yellow skull door near the beginning of the level to pick up the red skull key, which can be used to reveal the exit. The Spirit World is one of the more abstract Doom levels. It implements numerous false walls and demands the player use unorthodox secret hunting techniques to progress. It also has a couple of side areas near the beginning that are entirely optional. So, it's both artistically and mechanically just... weird. It's actually pretty unlike any of the other levels in Doom 2, visually, and while it can serve as a callback to the brilliant hell design in the original Doom, it still stands on its own. With the strange, abstract geography of the caverns that accompany the level, the swarm of spider demons, multiple invulnerability spheres, nearly a half dozen arch vials peppered throughout, and so much to make you feel less like an action hero, and more like an explorer in a Lovecraftian world. The spirit world sucks you into a setting that feels like a subworld of doom itself. It is awe-inspiring in every possible good way. And number one, Hanger. Doom, E1, M1. Look, it's as simple as this. A classic never dies. But in this case, nearly every square inch of the undeniably iconic opening descent to Doom, Hangar, is ingrained into the psyches and memories of nearly every Doom fan the world over. John Romero has stated in an interview with IGM that Hangar was designed to be the first level in Doom from conception. Literally, every detail was meticulously thought out and presented in a way where they knew it would be the first level players would experience. Interestingly, it was also the very last level the team developed. Romero states that the reason for this is because level designers should generally always design the first level last, stating, by the time you're making the last level of the game, you're really good at making levels. So, essentially, the last level you design is typically your best. It would seem as though that rationale has paid off over time. Hangar was designed to last in the memories of gamers all around the world. It was made to suck anyone behind the keyboard into the world of demonic sci-fi action from the word go, and it has undoubtedly fulfilled those expectations. From the prominent blue carpeting to the corpses strewn about, to the windows peering outside, the environment is a spectacle to discover from the beginning. You can peer out the window to see an exterior courtyard and a pool of a strange green substance with a fancy blue breastplate at its center. Or, you can immediately move to the left to see a steep set of stairs with peculiar pillars on either side. The stairs lead to what can be perceived as a command deck, with green security armor proudly awaiting you. Or, you can forget the distractions and plow yourself directly into the action by sprinting down the hall directly in front of you, opening the door and taking on the zombies eagerly awaiting your arrival. This room is dominated by computer terminals and monitors showcasing beautiful texture mapping. After dashing by this room, you find a decidedly more open interior, where toxic sludge has eaten away portions of the floor. Be careful crossing, and... Wait, what is... Th OH GOD, IT THROWS FIRE! After opening the door on the other end of this room, you're only greeted by more enemies, but... What happens if you shoot that barrel? Oh, that's the stuff. 
And we haven't even mentioned the immortal music that blares out while playing the level. The track, titled At Doom's Gate, is instantly recognizable and has served as an unofficial theme song for Doom as a franchise. The tune is so iconic that metal enthusiasts and music aficionados have given their own spin on the riffs time and time again. It's been covered before, and it will be covered again, and again, and again, and it will never get old. The fact of the matter is that Hangar simply is Doom. It has always represented Doom. It's been played through hundreds of millions of times, and it will be played through millions more. It will continue to be iconic and emblematic of a tectonic shift in the world of gaming. John Romero's level was built from the ground up to be eternal. And there is definitively no denying that Eternal is a perfect descriptor for what is very likely the best classic Doom level of all time. 